uh, uh, password and stuff for Three Corners. My name is Ciel. I'm an integrative therapist at Three Corners. Um, it has been my pleasure to already interact with Mariah. We had her come and do a, well, did an online cooking class with us. What was that, two weeks ago, Mariah, I think? And um, we're really happy to have her back for our mental health forum. So I'm going to give a brief introduction and then pass it right over. So, um, so Maria, Mariah is uh, from Northwest Montana, and she is of Blackfeet and Cherokee ancestry. She recently graduated from Columbia University with a degree in environmental engineering and has returned home where she has developed a, an organization called Indigi Kitchen. And I encountered her work on CBC a couple of years ago or a year and a bit ago. Um, and was really impressed by her wisdom and what she presented um, and really wanted to have her come and interact with our community whenever possible. So um, Mariah has been recognized as a champion for change through the Center for Native American Youth, a culture of health leader through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and a Grist 50 fixer. And she's currently on the board of the Native Youth Food Sovereignty Alliance. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Mariah. Um, thank you so much, Maria. We're so happy to have you here. Hi there. Awesome. Um, I hope everyone can see me and hear me okay. I'm in fact in a sketchy place with limited internet. It is my house. <laughs> um, the reservation doesn't yet have the capacity to run internet to actual houses, so I get to be set up on a hotspot. Um, so I hope that everything stays connected for this and everyone is able to uh, communicate and get the information we need. Um, people can ask questions through the chat box um, and we'll stay on top of that. I'm going to run through a relatively short PowerPoint. I know that this may have been sent out to you guys if you had a chance to look at it. Great. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, we're gonna go through it now. Um, and then if there are questions that folks have, um, we can, you can ask them as we go through the chat box and then we'll have time at the end for questions as well. So thanks everyone for hopping on. I'm going to share my screen so that we can get set up with this. All right. You had a brief introduction of who I am, but I'll just kick it off. Um, again, I am, uh, I'm Skuppi Bikani and Chaligi. I am uh, Blackfeet and I currently live on the Blackfeet Nation in Montana. I am about 10 minutes south of the border. Uh, just normally actually, I do my grocery shopping in Alberta, um, but with the border closed, I've been running about three miles away to a uh, and mom's in Cherokee, done in Oklahoma. I did get my uh, undergraduate degree in environmental engineering from Columbia University, and I'm finishing my master's in environmental science at um, SUNY ESF in Syracuse. So know that some of you that are here may get to hear from my thesis advisor later, um, Robin Wall Kimmer. Uh, it's really awesome. Really, you guys are lucky to talk to her. So that's exciting. Um, and the work I did is founded in the education. I started this work because of a number of different factors, but I try to frame everything that I do in this historical context and reminding people that food is more than just about nutrition and what we're putting into our bodies. Um, but there's also a whole historical context, especially when it comes to First Nations people. And so I remind people about um, the foundations of the US and Canada and our ties in this colonial forces um, and the way that they worked to control our sources of food and navigate where our food was coming from in order to um, be able to control uh, our people. And so a few short years after the founding of the US in 1776, um, there was retaliation against the Haudenosaunee Confederacy or the Iroquois 
um, for siding with the French and the retaliation came in the form of burning villages and crop stores that the Haudenosaunee people had planted and stored. Um, and the idea was, of course, it was about controlling food. It wasn't just about targeting the people themselves, but it was about controlling the entire food system. And so this has been foundational in many different forms of warfare, but it's been um, central in the way that colonialism has uh, worked to control the systems in our countries. So um, I also show people, um, because I'm from the Great Plains and uh, bison was such an important food out here, um, I talk about the destruction of the bison population and um, the way that bison were brought to the brink of extinction because the goal of eliminating bison was of course also to control native people. Um, on the plains you have like the Great Sioux Wars when you're looking at the Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota people and um, their resistance to colonial occupation. Um, of course with food being able to be found almost anywhere in the form of bison and root vegetables and berries, you see people don't need to be in one spot. You don't have villages that can be targeted. You don't have um, cities like in Europe that could be barricaded off and you know could be held until people ran out of food. Instead, our people could travel and get food anywhere. And therefore, the idea was to eliminate all of that source of food. Um, with the population of bison, of course, um, for my people, I show this image because it's such a dramatic representation of how bison populations were decimated. Um, this man is standing on top of a pile of bison skulls that were later collected to be ground up and used for fertilizer in agriculture. Um, it's a dramatic representation of the bison decimation. So this is an image that I show. Um, just, I've shown this um, for a lot of people because it's really hard to conceptualize what it means to move from 20 million down to about a thousand in the matter of about 40 years. Um, those populations were dramatically reduced and along with it a major source of food. For tribes in Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, Manitoba, and of course the Great Plains in the States, you're seeing that it's had a huge effect. For tribes out in British Columbia, um, there was a lot of other uh, work that was done. Of course, as colonization moved generally from the east to the west, we see different tactics taken. Um, as we look out on in the Pacific area, we see um, these unceded lands um, that were, of course, entirely um, managed by First Nations people for hunting, fishing, and harvesting being reduced into small, small, small reserves. Um, Canada generally has much smaller reserves than the U.S. has, which means, of course, that the areas that First Nations people have for traditional hunting and fishing has been limited. Um, and along with it, there have been extensive fights about who is allowed to engage in fishing and harvesting. And then of course you look at some of these large scale infrastructure projects that have also had dramatic effects on the way that people obtain their food. You look at dams that have been built that block um, salmon and other fish from going up river to tribes that traditionally had access to them. You look at the division of land into private property and the limitations that we see on traditional harvesting and gathering 
And then we look at generally the reduction of a lot of game species. Of course, like doesn't always apply to things like deer, um, where we have lots of overpopulation problems and challenge and management in that. Um, you see diseases that also come through that affect those things. So in certain places, they're looking at a lot of chronic wasting disease, which affects the ability to harvest meat. Um, in the Northeast, you see um, a huge amount of ticks that are having really dramatic effects on uh, animal populations out there. So things like that, that we're navigating as well. So I throw this up um, because we talk about this really fairly rapid transition from diets where native people were self-sustaining in terms of all of our food. Um, we harvested, grew, hunted, or gathered. Um, to almost 100% dependence on government food systems. So we look at things like ration cards. Um, these are images of ration cards. It's actually interesting to look at some of the historical work that's been done around ration cards because the importance of them um, was such that people would bead and make little pouches specifically for these cards. Um, this is became family's almost entire source of food. And it depended on how many people were in the family, um, but they would obtain, uh, you know, certain allotments of things like flour, sugar, lard, um, beef, things like that, and would be expected to live off of this. So a lot of these foods were of course not indigenous, not recognized as foods, and people developed uh, different food products based off of the things that they were receiving in ration boxes. Things like fry bread um, or bannock. I realize my memes are southern specific. Um, but we look at um, you know this huge shift that we move from diets high in protein and low in a lot of saturated fats. You know, wild game meats don't have a lot of fat on them. Um, diets much higher in uh, these bad fats and high in empty carbohydrates, higher in sugars, things like that. And so we're seeing a really rapid transition and we start getting other things incorporated into our diets like dairy um, that we did not have the enzymes to process. Um, for native people, we're generally a about 90% lactose intolerant, which is similar to Asian populations and African populations. Um, whereas Western European uh, descendants generally have only about a 5% lactose intolerance rate. And it's just because um, it, you know, it takes generations to um, have those enzymes that are able to digest lactose. Um, so it's interesting when we look at a lot of government food programs that also mandate consumption of dairy products in order to receive subsidies. Um, and so you look at that as part of uh, an interesting way of incorporating the nutritional allowance that we were given. Um, for most Native people, we did get uh, plenty of calcium, but it generally came in the form of um, things like bone broth that we're consuming a lot of, things like wood ash that was used to season food and um, to treat things like corn for an exploration, um, just different things like that. So different ways of obtaining calcium, but a lot of what we hear now generally sounds like calcium comes from milk and that's how you build strong bones. So there's been a cultural shift, of course. Um, so we now see government subsidized food programs come in a little bit different shape than ration cards and meat boxes, um, but you still see food that is generally um, designed to be shelf stable, designed to keep for a long period of time, um, and you're not getting a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables because of course they're not shelf stable. Things generally come in cans, including meat, um, Canned meat in itself is, of course, not inherently bad, um, but for a lot of people, you know, preserving things, uh, 
generally the less fresh your vegetables and fruits are is going to reduce the uh, vitamins and minerals that your body is able to process in them. You're also seeing a lot of things like dry pasta, um, things with a lot of white flour in them, um, stuff like that. And high sugary fruit juices, and of course, uh, powdered milk. So the reason I got involved in all of this was actually because of seeing the health outcomes that come along with this. So these health outcomes um, are pretty dramatic. I think some of the most dramatic statistics that I've seen including, include about half of Native children that are born today developing type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. Um, that's really concerning, but also you know, not only do Native people face generally higher rates of type 2 diabetes, um, but they're more likely, we're more likely to die from diabetes when we get it um, because of one, continued access or continued limited access to fresh foods, um, but also challenges within the healthcare systems that Native people have access to. So I think that's worth mentioning as well. So I got involved in this because of these health outcomes, but it's a lot more about, um, there's a lot more components than just health outcomes. I think um, Western culture tends to put food and nutrition into a box of how you're taking care of your body, but I think it's really much more holistic based in terms of how we take care of the lands where our food comes from. Um, and it's much more of a complex system than just you know, mathematical formulas of what we're putting into our body. So there is a term called food sovereignty, which has become very important for folks to mention uh, when we're talking about um, food within indigenous communities, not just within the US and Canada, but also for international uh, indigenous communities and rural communities in general actually talk about this as well. Um, food sovereignty means a lot of different things. We've probably heard about sovereignty as we talk about um, you know the status of indigenous nations and what political sovereignty means um, but food sovereignty I think is a component of political sovereignty in that it is about our ability to care for ourselves and to manage our own affairs when it comes to our nutrition. So food sovereignty is defined um, as having access to food that is healthy, of course making sure that our bodies are actually able to get those mathematical formulas um, and power ourselves and give ourselves the vitamins, the calories, the minerals, and this breakdown of protein, fats, and um, carbs that are necessary to sustain our lives. Um, of course, it's the affordable. So we need to have food that is accessible for individuals at every level of the socioeconomic spectrum. We also look at food that is culturally appropriate. So we want to recognize food as part of our identities and who we are as people. So for culturally appropriate food for different First Nations communities, that takes the shape of different things. Um, of course, what's culturally appropriate to people in the southeastern United States, and, you know, looking at corn, bean, squash, the three sisters, is not necessarily what is classified as traditional foods, especially in British Columbia, right, where we're looking at more seafoods, we're looking at a lot of wild berries, we're looking at different root vegetables like camas, um, different things like that. So culturally appropriate. Um, for folks living um, generally modern diets, I think of this as if you were to create food systems that were both healthy and affordable, but were based off of crickets or grasshoppers, and you're saying, well, you know, I don't understand why you don't like this food. It's healthy and everyone can afford it, but it's not necessarily recognized as cultural foods for you know, what we're used to. And that's important. It's important that we're able to gain the foods that um, are recognizable to us as people in the societies that we live in. I also think it's really important to mention the sustainable methods and policy that comes along with uh, food sovereignty. It 
in, entails our ability to create laws and governance structures that allow us to um, regulate the food systems in our communities. And so that looks like, you know, maybe it looks like organic food policy and having a system of codes about how we're labeling what is organic food. Of course, on a national level, we have standards for that type of thing. Even provinces and cities have their own food and agricultural codes, but not all First Nations do. And so it is important to look at how we are navigating those things, what we're allowing to be the harvest of those things. You know, do we have our own fish and wildlife programs that regulate the hunting? of those things on reserve or for community members off reserve, but exercising treaty rights. You know, how are we going to regulate those things? And I think that's really important to mention as part of food sovereignty. So the work that I do as part of Indigit Kitchen has been to connect with a lot of folks working on access and the folks that are doing the work about making sure that our communities have access to fresh, healthy, traditional foods, um, and remind people about the work that goes into preparing them. So teaching a lot of cooking classes, demonstrations, I make cooking videos for online work. So if anyone's interested, I'll drop my links at the bottom. Um, so you can look at different cooking videos using traditional indigenous ingredients. And I think that's really important because as we work to restore access to foods in our communities, um, we also have to restore that traditional knowledge. You know, our foods do not exist in a vacuum. And just because something is edible, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we all have the information about how to prepare it so that it is nutritious and delicious and our children will eat it because I think that's really important. Um, I've met a lot of adults that don't know how to cook zucchini and or um, you know, don't know the best way to harvest or to cook berries or to prepare the berries in their area. And I think that that's really important um, because it helps us unlock a deeper connection with those foods, but also ensures that we will continue to eat them. Um, and you can't get the nutritional benefit of food if you're not eating it. So that's why I do the work that I do. Um, I think I run through some different foods when I'm talking um, just to drop some information for foods that you probably have access to if you've seen them. Um, lamb's quarter grows like a weed in many, many different places and it tastes almost exactly like spinach. Um, it's in the quinoa and amaranth family and it has wonderful leaves that can be harvested as I said just like spinach and you can either grind it into really mild pesto in a blender or it can be made into a lovely salad. Wild onions, a lot of people have been out harvesting wild onions or leeks or ramps around this time. All of course uh, delicious spring vegetables that grow in many different places and different varieties. Talk about mussels, mussels are really important to folks, especially out um, in the coastal regions, um, high in iron. Uh, there's of course different ways to cook mussels and I think it's important to point out that it's an indigenous food and it's not just something fancy for people in restaurants. <laughs> they can be harvested and prepared. Crook neck squash, so this is one of the example of um, a squash that Native people have cultivated over centuries. Um, it's very specific breeding and agricultural work that was done in order to cultivate um, an ancestor of the butternut. And so this is essentially like a butternut squash, but with a really, really, really long neck. And all of that is filled with edible meats that can be prepared into soups. It can be baked. It can be cut up into cubes and eaten kind of like sweet potatoes are. Elderberries, this is one of dozens of berry varieties that we have on Turtle Island that grows. Elderberries are also great because they have a lot of medicinal value for fighting the flu, um, but they're edible if cooked. And I have a recipe for elderberry barbecue sauce on my website. Um, but of course, 
lots of different berries that we have access to. All blueberries are indigenous to North America. We have a variety of native raspberry. We have Saskatoon berries. We have cranberries. Um, we have huckleberries. We have thimbleberries. Lots and lots of berries that we have access to. And most are delicious raw. Um, wild rice is important to people in the Great Lakes region. I post this picture because there is both this uh, cultivated wild rice, which looks black in color, um, but people don't like it. <laughs> um, and the true hand harvested wild rice, which it has been parched over wood and had hand harvested and actually is a true wild rice rather than a cultivated variety. Wild rice is not a rice, by the way, but is a grass seed and the methods of harvesting from canoes actually knock the grass seed both into the canoe to harvest it, but also back into the water to help reseed it. So the amazing food that is wild rice actually relies partially on harvest by people in order to regenerate itself. Um, there's many other examples of foods that are similar to this that have evolved over centuries of interaction with indigenous people um, a lot of root vegetables function in this way, where digging them up actually helps them regenerate themselves. It gives off um, different rhizomes in the soil, which help create future generations of those root vegetables. And without harvest, those plants are actually facing endangered status, um, which is interesting and something that um, I'm looking at actually for my thesis work, but it's about indigenous land management. And then of course the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. You've probably heard of these things in different contexts because of the way that they grow together. Um, corn grows up, beans wrap around the corn, and then squash spreads out on the ground. It kind of shields the rest of the ground so that a lot of weeds don't grow up. Um, and also kind of provides a shade layer which helps keep in moisture in the soil. Um, corn, beans, and squash are also really cool because the different proteins that they have form a complete protein. It provides all the essential amino acids um, and helps create, you know, essentially uh, the, a complete protein, which you would only otherwise get from eating meat or by combining different uh, other vegetables and grains, or by eating a couple of plants I know of have complete proteins like quinoa or amaranth. Um, there's not very many protein or plants by themselves that have complete proteins. I also think the three sisters are really cool because when you plant them together, they actually produce more calories um, per hectare of land than if you were just to plant monocultures. So they help regenerate the soil in part because of the nitrogen fixation that the beans create, um, but you're actually able to get a higher crop yield and more calories and more protein per land area than if you were just planting things by themselves. Um, of course, I have uh, students in different classes that I've spoken to that of course will chirp up and say like, well, why aren't we just planting things in the Three Sisters? Why, why are we making it complicated and we're not um, producing as much food that, as we can um, and we're just planting in one crop? And of course, the answer to that is that when you plant three different things that require three different harvest methods, um, you can harvest that stuff by hand on small scales, and it's pretty efficient. You can grow this in your garden. You produce a lot of food in a small area, but the large scale of agriculture that's typically done with big machines that harvest doesn't allow for complicated um, but regenerative forms of agriculture. Um, and then some kid in class when I responded to that said, oh, if they really wanted to develop a type of machine that could harvest all three of these, they could. They just don't want to. <laughs> and it's probably true. <laughs> so um, there's also obviously lots of other foods. Um, we look at chilies, pine nuts, huckleberries. I talked about some of these before. Um, different nuts that are available. So um, we look at beaked hazelnuts, black walnuts, acorns. Um, we think about pecans, which is actually an Anishinaabe word, which just means nut. Um, we look at different fish 
which were, of course, freshwater fish were eaten by different people. This is a walleye picture down there. And then, of course, um, salmon were incredibly important to many, many people. And then, see, I have a little picture of amaranth down here. I have acorn squash, sunflower seeds. I think sunflowers are another really interesting food that was very specifically bred over generations. There are no uh, wild sunflowers that exist with big edible seeds. Those have all been very specifically um, bred by people in the Southwest in order to uh, generate the big edible seeds that we are now able to grow in our gardens. Um, and then of course, things like cactus. So cactus, prickly pear cactus, both the actual um, plants I posted down here is edible, but also they create um, flowers and fruits. And those fruits are also edible and have kind of an interesting sweet taste to them. So lots and lots of foods that we eat all the time um, and have actually become really important staple foods in a lot of the world. So the work that I do um, has been teaching a lot of people how to use this stuff. This is a picture of myself and Sean Sherman of the sous chef um, working on a demonstration together. Um, and then I also create videos and um, teach people information about, you know, different ingredients. So maple sugar, which is of course made of, from maple sap that's harvested in the late winter, really early spring. Um, this is a video that I make. And if you guys are interested in more videos like this, you can go to my website. I'll drop that at the very end. Um, it didn't play. It was a really simple video. Um, I get a lot more complicated on things, but I figured that'd be a really easy one to show you guys. Um, just demonstrating um, how to make things really accessible, especially when you're dealing with uh, foods that people don't necessarily know how to prepare and aren't used to reading recipe books. I think it's cool that we have the ability to make things accessible using digital media. I think it's especially cool during a time like now when we're not able to gather for big in-person cooking classes when we're not able to share that information face-to-face. -face. Um, and for especially people that are um, the most vulnerable in this time, it's cool to have access to this information and also to be able to watch it and look it up over and over again. So also posted things like um, elk tri-tip with sweet potatoes and getting complicated and making things like pad thai using only indigenous ingredients. So using things like zucchini noodles, um, bell peppers, of course, um, all chilies, all peppers are indigenous to Central America, they're indigenous foods. Um, so looking up things like that and then just dreaming up recipes and taking that ancestral knowledge that we have and putting it into the 21st century and making it really accessible to everyone. And now this is, this is my goal. Um, to have Native people re-looking at traditional foods and seeing how easy they can be to make, how delicious they can be to make, and how we can share them and turning away from things that have been uh, forced upon us and helped us survive a period that would have otherwise meant starvation, um, but are now, you know, it was, it's a survival food and I think that we deserve to be feeding ourselves healthier and better foods. So this is me, this is my information. You guys are welcome to give me a follow on any of the platforms you want. Um, and happy to open myself up to questions. I haven't looked at the chat box, but I can now um, and see what people are talking about. Thank you, Mariah. And to everyone listening, if you want to just ask questions directly because there are not so many people on right now. We've, I think we've just got 18 people on. So if you have any questions directly for Mariah, you can uh, go for it. Mariah, would you mind um, switching back to the camera so people can see you? 
Yes, it can. There we go. Great. So does anybody have any questions? I've got a couple questions, but I want to ask everybody listening first. I have a question. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Um, how, how do you use the cactus? So cactus, um, cactus. cactus specifically, um, it can be actually eaten raw. Of course, you have to take the spines off. That's the most important part about eating cactus. Um, so it's taking the spines off. And I've done it with a pocket knife out in the field. Um, and if you eat it, it kind of tastes like cucumber, only a little bit sweeter. Um, but it's actually, it's prepared in a lot of um, southwestern U.S. and northern Mexican dishes. And it's called nopales, N-O-P-A-L-E-S. And you can look up recipes for nopales, but they're cooked. Um, and uh, people do a lot of really cool things with nopales to season them. Um, but I've also had friends that use the prickly pear fruit and they'll make jams and jellies out of it. Um, use that. So different things you can do with prickly pear cactus. I just try to avoid stepping on them because in Montana, they're not really big. They're just uh, tiny and hidden on the prairies and they will go right through your moccasins if you're walking around on the prairies and moccasins, so. Other questions? Thanks. Anyone else have any questions out there? Huh? Bunch of quiet observers. Um, so, Mara, if I may ask, um, you were referencing indigenous people not having the enzymes to break down dairy. Um, I, I would assume that this is probably hypothetical or just kind of a projected um, idea, but do you make any direct sort of associations between that lack of enzymes and like mental health or overall well-being because of an inability to break it down? Um, I, so this is complicated. Um, I think that for a lot of like school lunch programs, especially that, um, you know, if you're, if you're getting reimbursable meals from the government in school lunch programs, there's generally a mandate for a serving of dairy in a lot of those. Um, generally takes the form of like a carton of milk or something. Um, but it's interesting because of course those are meals that are going to lower income students. Um, and those are the meals that they're getting. Of course, a lot of kids are getting cartons of milk in their school lunches and that's pretty typical. Um, but if you're looking at lower income families that um, whose kids are being mandated to receive a serving of dairy. Um, when you look at uh, native communities that both have high rates of lactose intolerance and um, you know high poverty rates that are receiving that, um, I think that it makes it challenging for children to focus in school when they're having digestive issues. Um, so I you know, generally, I don't put any dairy in my recipes, obviously, um, and, and, you know, try to avoid cooking with a lot of it just for the well-being of my family. Um, but I think that, you know, even, you know, when you're looking at people that aren't able to process a certain food, and that's being put in a lot of essential, you know, food pyramids or nutrition guidelines, that's really challenging um, because Native people were getting all the nutrients that we're being told that dairy is giving us, but in other methods. Awesome, so I see a question in the chat box. Um, did that answer that question? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, I think anytime you're sitting in intestinal discomfort, it's not great otherwise for your mm -hmm. happiness and morale. Um, but um, someone asked a question. Um, if you're not looking at the chat box, it's um, saying, how is your work and your message being received in indigenous communities? Um, and I think that 
generally people are really excited and have a huge interest in learning more about traditional indigenous foods, both from their own tribe um, and from other native people. I think it's really cool to see the vast amount of knowledge that native people um, have been utilizing both in plant identification and use, both medicinally and for food purposes, to agriculture, um, ranging from, you know, companion planting and the things that were done there, but also to, you know, irrigation techniques, water saving methods, um, all of these different things. You look at traditional butchering methods and the way that, um, you know, every part of animals were utilized. I think people have a lot of interest in learning about that, but unless you are studying with um, elders in your community, unless you're working directly with people that have that knowledge, you can't Google it. It's really hard to find. And so um, my work has been mainly to make that really accessible. It's been to make things shareable on social media. Of course, not sharing privileged information about traditional medicines, but things that people want shared out there. So I'm hoping to work on more projects um, in different communities, talking to elders that have information they want to share, but don't necessarily have um, the technology to get that out. Because people are really excited about it. I get pictures all the time of people telling me, oh, I made this recipe, but we had this ingredient here instead so I used this and it turned out really good and here's a picture and you know people are sending me these things so I know that people are making them. I meet people at conferences that don't realize that I'm the person behind Indigi Kitchen and they've been using recipes from my site um, and they meet me and they go oh I made your bison butternut lasagna I love it um, or something like that and so people are always coming up and telling me that they've been using my recipes um, which is great. And I think that that's the entire point. If people are sending me pictures that they've made of my recipes, it means they're making food, they're eating it, they're making it their own. Um, and that's what I think is really exciting about it. So uh, that's another question in the chat box. Do you have any recommendations on books to read regarding identifying indigenous plants, uh, regarding identifying plants and other indigenous foods? Uh, I think it depends really regionally on what you're looking at. Um, I think there, for folks in that region, um, I would say finding a local, um, thinking edible and medicinal plants. I know there's edible and medicinal plants of the Rocky Mountains that might help with a lot of things. Um, but finding a local um, plants uh, identification book, there's often references in there about which plants are edible. And then looking um, at blogs, so if you're looking at like Camus, um, Camus is generally the picture in your plant identification book is going to have a picture of the flower in bloom. Um, but not most people will harvest after the flower blooms. And so then it's harder to identify. You know, what are you looking for? So then I generally recommend Googling it. Um, and there's actually a lot of foragers blogs that are out there and they'll have recipes for a lot of that type of thing and about how to prepare them as well. So I was looking at doing canvas bake. And so that's what I did is I Googled it um, and looked at important identification information and then um, about, you know, how long you bake canvas for. Traditionally, it was done in a big underground pit for three days <laughs> in coals um, and that's to break down different compounds that are really hard for our body to digest um, and it eventually turns them into sugars so they're almost sweet at the end um, and this person said yeah bake it in your oven for it's like a really low temperature like 250 degrees fahrenheit for it was like 15 hours <laughs> So you have to bake things for a really long time. And if someone, if it just says in a book, like, oh, this plant edible, it doesn't help you out. So I recommend um, finding some foragers blogs on that. Um, uh, let's see. Let food be thy medicine, given that indigenous people have an increased rate of 
type two diabetes? Have you seen any foods that reverse it once it's diagnosed? You know, I've seen um, some peer reviewed studies that actually talk about Saskatoon berries, also called service berries, service berries, or service berries, um, that show that it's really helpful in regulation of blood sugar. So I know there's actually research being done, of course, to turn that into some type of uh, drug and market it to people. But I've read that Saskatoon berries are really good for regulating blood sugar. Um, nothing else immediately comes to mind on that front. Um, but I think that generally you look at most indigenous foods and you're not going to see that same blood sugar spike that we're seeing with white flour and white sugar um, that are so common in our diets now. Awesome. See your comments. Let's see. Switch over to the Canadian food guide to a more Mediterranean style. Do you think we're on the right track? Yeah, I think that um, the more we get away from, you know, highly processed uh, foods, then the more we're on the right track. Um, so, you know, we're looking at things that are less about recommending um, high, uh, high fat foods, um, and high empty carbs. I remember we were looking a lot at like all of these whole grains and, um, you know, those things could be classified as everything from like a slice of bread to pasta to muffins. And that was recommended that we were getting so many servings of those things in our daily diets. And I think that the more we're turning away from that and we're looking at you know, just eating more fruits and vegetables, whether they're indigenous or not in nature, I think we're much more on the right track. Um, awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. Have any other questions or are we looking at wrapping up? Uh, oh, and I think there's one there, sorry. Just looks like a comment there. Thank you. Thank you guys for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you, Mariah. You're really wonderful. We're so grateful to have you here. Um, hopefully for everyone watching, we are still intending to have some future cooking classes with Mariah um, and bring her back again because she was so well received from everyone. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at Three Corners. Everyone has my email address or to Mariah directly. Um, for those of you who arrived early, your name went into a draw, and we have um, four prizes for Danielle, Randy, Tara, and Tammy. So they'll be ready at Three Corners next week, and you can come pick them up. There's just gift bags with some, uh, some treats from all the speakers from this week. So thank you guys so much. Thank you again, Mariah. Thank you. Okay. Take care, everyone. See you guys. Stay safe.